McGill Program Manager. Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm Jesse Ehrlich, the McGill Program Manager for the MedTech Talent Accelerator. Uh, welcome to today's Explore MedTech seminar presented by the MedTech Talent Accelerator. We're honored to have with us our speaker, Richard Roy, Vice President of Product Development and Scale-Up at Applied Pharmaceutical Innovation, who today will present his talk uh, called Medical Devices, a Transition Story from Engineering to Quality and Regulatory. Before we start, I'd like to do a land acknowledgement. So McGill University is on land which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst indigenous peoples, including the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabeg nations. We acknowledge and thank the diverse indigenous peoples whose presence marks this territory on which peoples of the world now gather. Richard, without further ado, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> thank you uh, everyone for joining today. Thank you to the MedTech Acceler Tal Accelerator team as well and the University of Calgary. Today, I just wanna go through kind of a little bit about my um, my career progression, um, hopefully giving you some information about the med technology industry um, and just how I did my path uh, in this area over the years. Um, so uh, yeah, as, as was said earlier, my um, presentation is titled Medical Devices, a Transition Story from Engineering to Quality and Regulatory. Um, so just a little bit about the organization that I'm currently at. Um, we are called Applied Pharmaceutical Innovations. Uh, what we try to do is facilitate world-class innovation in pharmaceuticals in pharmaceuticals, but beyond that, we actually do support medical devices, in vitro diagnostics, natural health products, um, and beyond um, in, in the other areas around, for example, controlled substances and whatnot. So we, so we're actually more diversified than even what this uh, this slide gives. Um, and really, what our purpose is is to support uh, innovators, uh, small medium enterprises, and even beyond um, in their you know what I call the product development journey. Um, and utilizing the knowledge that we've developed over the years in industry to help them in that journey. And that's kind of you know what we'll discuss a little bit today in my own journey, which has helped lead to me uh, to get to this role and to be able to support innovators in the industry. So just a little bit about myself. Um, you probably saw the little bio, um, but you know just to go over, you know, I, I do have a chemical engineering degree from McGill University um, and a master's in biotechnology from the University of Toronto. And I've spent the last 20 years in the life sciences sector, uh, working on all those different products I was mentioning earlier, uh, with a focus on product development, quality, and regulatory. So just to show you kind of my progression, and this is kind of more of a summary slide, and I'll go into more details in the actual slides following. But uh, you know, I started my career really just out of uh, you know the engineering side, working as a validation specialist and an engineering project specialist for companies like Aventus Pasteur, which is vaccines, and Merck, uh, Merck Gen Farm, which is um, on the generic side in small molecule manufacturing um, pharmaceuticals. And so, you know, at that, that time, you know, my focus was really on facility and equipment, uh, given my background. Um, but then I pivoted um, to the, I'll use the term quality systems. I'll talk a little bit about what quality systems mean in a later slide, but it was kind of something intriguing about this industry with, the, you know, the regulations and the quality systems that are set up to, in order to meet those regulations. Um, so I became fascinated by that and I actually made the pivot to the quality side of the industry uh, becoming the quality systems manager um, for a company out in Alberta that was getting into both the medical device space and the pharma space. Um, through the years of experience, um, you know, I did develop my kind of expertise in the quality and regulatory side. And then given my technical background, you know, I, I kind of was a natural kind of fit for the product development aspect as well. So I ended up becoming the head of quality, regulatory and product development, what I call kind of three critical areas of the organization uh, in the medical device space and, and pharma space. Um, just because, you know, the, the processes and the deliverables, you know, from the regulatory perspective, they were so interrelated and it was really a natural fit. And then later in my career, um, you know, as I've seen the success of my organizations, I did decide to go into a consulting role. Um, and the consulting role is basically taking all the information that I was had accumulated over the years of experience in the industry and seeing all the successful launches, you know, seeing, you know, patients using our products in hospitals, you know, seeing patients, you know, uh, have conditions treated by our products and that kind of thing. It was, you know, I, I decided I want to do that in a consulting capacity. Um, so I, I made the, um, the switch to consulting. So uh, today I want to talk about three kind of what I call main themes of this progression. Um, and, you know, I wanted to kind of give this a kind of high level, you know, notes about, you know, what you can think about as you get into the med medical technology sector. Uh, the first one was a process-based approach. 
So, you know, basically because I took chemical engineering, which is very process-based engineering, and then, you know, with a focus on biotechnology, a lot of time was spent on these processes, whether in petrochemical or in, uh, you know, healthcare or in agriculture, you know, we were looking, we we're looking at the science and the processes behind that as you look at the, the design and manufacture of those products, which was very intriguing. So I always kind of learned from there that this process mindset. And then to add to that is another concept of risk, risk-based approach. A risk-based approach, I mean, risk is inherent everywhere, as we know. It's in our everyday lives, right? But within you know, the medical device sector, it is also very pertinent. Uh, for example, you know, when you're designing a medical device, um, risk is absolutely part of that uh, process. And there's a, you know, tools out there, such as the failure modes and effects analysis, where you use these tools to determine the risks related to the design of your product and ensure you deal with those, you mitigate those risks so that you get the safety and, of course, you know, the effectiveness of your device. Um, corresponding to the intended use. So it's a very important tool. And then beyond that, as you look at risk, you know, when products on the market, then you're looking at what I'll call post-market work with things like customer complaints or potentially an adverse event. Um, those are important when you're looking at the risk of those complaints and what you need to do because of those. And then there's also, you know, risk tools utilized in things like vendor management, which is a key quality system where you're looking at, you know, what level of uh, control or scrutiny do you have to have on a manufacturer of, say the most important thing that goes in your product versus someone that's doing you know, much less risk work for your organization. So your vendor management is also based off of a risk approach. Uh, specifically, there is a, an ISO standard 14971 uh, that talks about this um, application risk management in medical devices. So it's definitely worth a look at that standard. Um, the third part I would say would be the appreciation for the regulations. You know, medical, medical devices, you know, in vitro diagnostics, it's a highly regulated industry. And that's for a reason. Obviously, what we're doing with these products, you know, with uh, diagnosis or treatment of patients is very important that we make sure we get it right. Um, so, you know, once I started in the healthcare industry, working for some of these multinationals I did, you know, that they, the GXPs or the GMPs, you know, were really at the forefront. And, you know, I really took, uh, you know, I, I noticed how important they were and really took, uh, you know, it resonated with me, right? So uh, that's really where I kept developing my kind of understanding and skills in the GMP area as well. So all three of these, the process base, the risk base, and the appreciation for the regulations, I say were key to the progression of my career. So first I was talking about the facility and production equipment. That was kind of when I was talking about, you know, early in my career when I was dealing with engineering. You know, because, you know, you don't know where you, you're going to end up in this industry, it's important to kind of go over some of those and, and, and what, you know, what's involved in, for example, facility design and qualification. You know, when you're setting up a facility to manufacture a medical device or a drug or a natural health product, there's a lot of considerations that need to go into that, which includes, you know, questions like which room uh, will be used for what stage of the production process? Like, you know, is it a warehouse? Is it a production room? Is it an incoming material area? You know, what, what uh, the material and personnel flows will look like. So, for example, it's not just, you know, we have the equipment. It's like, well, what does the process look like? Where are people going to come into these, you know, these areas and be able to do their jobs and make a safe and effective product? And then any regulatory requirements around room classifications. One term you'll hear, um, you know, is, um, you know, what, what, what class is your room, you know? And you'll hear, you know, like a standard like ISO 14644, which talks about the different classifications for rooms. And that's based off of, you know, cleanliness requirements, you know, particles in the air and stuff like that. Uh, and then cleaning requirements, um, like things like the, what the wall and floor is made of to ensure that you can do uh, adequate cleaning so that you, you know, you make sure your environment is safe for the production of that equipment. And then going into equipment selection and validation, this is more specific to the production equipment and not necessarily the medical technology you're, you're, you're manufacturing. Um, you know, you're looking at what is the equipment being used for? Are there any specific quality or technical requirements that that equipment needs to meet? And are there any kind of input or output uh, you know, considerations? Like for example, line speed, if you're doing a high throughput product, you of course wanna know, you know how many are you gonna be able to make and are you gonna be able to meet market demand as an example. Um, so how do these all connect back to the, this quality and regulatory world I was talking about? Um, so these all lead to like what I call key documents in the industry. Like uh, you'll hear terms like user requirement specifications, which lead to a functional specification, which leads to a design specification. These terms resonate in the industry because they're so important to set these properly and have them go from the URS, the FS, and the DS in the order that makes sense because that's how you're going to ensure your design is correct. So once you've got your design in place and you and you got your you're looking at your facility, you're looking at your equipment, you know then you're looking at terms like the factory acceptance tests or site acceptance tests when it actually comes to your manufacturing site. Uh, you'll hear terms like installation qualification, operational qualification, and performance qualification, uh, IQOQ, PQ for short, that you'll hear in the industry. And again, those are ensuring that the uh, facility is qualified and the equipment is validated for its purpose. 
And this all leads to what I call the end goal of process validation, which is you know that your production process and your facility is adequate for the, me the medical device that you're manufacturing. So as I mentioned, that was early in my career uh, where I was in the engineering side. So this kind of is where I transitioned. I fortunately got the opportunity to join a company out in Alberta that was supporting a, a company that was growing in medical devices and pharmaceuticals. So it was kind of a, you know, a, a bringing both quality systems into the, into the story, the GMPs from the pharmaceuticals, as well as the um, quality systems from the medical device perspective, which was quite interesting and it was very exciting. Um, so just to tell you a little bit about what those quality systems are as they related to the medical device side of it, um, here are some of these high level ones. Um, you may have seen these before, you may have not, but you know, it's, it's important to understand kind of um, you know, which of these standards are in place to make sure that the products we're making fulfill regulatory requirements and will you know, lead to safe and effective medical devices. Um, so the key one you probably heard is ISO 1345-2016. Um, again, this looks at the quality management system. It's an international standard. A lot of countries recognize this, including Canada. Uh, so it's a very important. And, um, and you know, when you're looking, I'll, I'll go into a little bit more specifics of what it involves, but it's a very important standard. The U.S. has their own 21 CFR Part 820 quality system regulations. There is a lot of overlap and similarities between the two, but they do have their own system under the Code of Federal Regulations. And then, you know, more specifically, Health Canada has also introduced the Canadian medical device regulations have been around uh, for a while, actually, uh, which goes a little bit more specific than ISO 1345 into the specific Canadian requirements. There is a term you'll hear uh, in the industry called medical device single audit program. Uh, this program was introduced not that long ago, and it's basically an organization that, that is looking at, you know, making these audits by registrars more efficient by covering more than one jurisdiction uh, during an, an ISO audit, like a certification audit for ISO 1345, as an example. And the countries that are participating in this program are countries like Australia, Brazil, Canada, Japan, and the US FDA. So I, as I mentioned, I, I just wanna expand a little bit. I'm not gonna go into all these in detail, but I wanted to kind of show you kind of high level that what does a quality management system involve, right? So if you look at the ISO standard or the, uh, the QSR in the US, you know, these are the main kind of points. The quality management system, which deals with control of documents and control of records, having SOPs, work instructions and forms to you know, do what you document, document what you do type of mentality, uh, management responsibility, another key point where it looks at management commitment to the organization to ensuring a quality culture and, and making sure that, you know, compliance is there and, and people, uh, staff know what their role is um, to achieve this compliance as an organization. Uh, resource management that looks at, you know, the training of staff and job descriptions that identify what the staff member is responsible for, which links directly to what training they'll need to have to be able to do their jobs properly. Uh, infrastructure and facilities to make sure you know, again talking about what I earlier on about the facility equipment making sure that the infrastructure is there to be able to manufacture that product. Uh, then the product realization itself, this is where you're actually you know designing and making the product so again, you know I mentioned design control earlier it's so important. Um, that you know your design control process is, is, is done properly and then change control, so if there are any post changes that are done to your design, there is a, a control process to make sure that the, the product or you know, uh, medical device is brought back into compliance with, after those changes are made. Another important aspect is purchasing, uh, where you're, you're buying supplies, you're buying equipment, you know, there's a bunch of different things you could, you could be purchasing as your business grows and as you manufacture product. And that really falls under what I call the category of vendor management, which again is a, to me, a very critical aspect of, of a medical technology company. Um, production and service provision and validation of processes. Um, you know, when you look at the term I mentioned earlier was process validation. It's so important that you have defined your manufacturing process and you've validated all the steps involved to make sure you have reproducibility um, that your product you're producing uh, is going to be, um, you know, meeting the safety and efficacy or effectiveness of that um, product that you're making. And then the last one on, on the product realization, uh, and again, these are highlights of the, the standard, not the exhaustive list of everything within the QMS, but um, the control of monitoring, measuring devices. So having your equipment program, making sure your equipment is calibrated, making sure it's maintained, you know, obviously making sure it's functioning properly. Um, then the other area within the standard is the measurement analysis and improvement. This one looks at, you know, as your manufacturing product, you know, what are you doing to, you know, kind of monitor its, its quality. So that's a control of non-conforming products. And then once it's on the market, that's complaint handling or good vigilance practices, they call when it's basically, you know, what happens when it's on the market and you get a complaint or something goes wrong in the field, you know, what needs to be done and what needs to be reported to the regulatory authorities. So if you're launching the product in Canada, it was an issue somewhere in Canada, you know, there's expectations um, that you report it depending on the severity of the issue. Um, and then internal audit, which I'll go a little bit more into internal audits later on, but it's an important tool that we have. And then corrective actions and preventive action, a term you may have heard, or CAPA for short. And again, this is a very powerful tool that you use to you know, address an issue, but also to continuously improve 
the organization. Um, so one area I did want to specifically talk about as you look at your journey into this medical technology field and, uh, and developing you know, medical products is this design development, um, you know, part of that quality system I was just mentioning. I'll go over briefly just some of the main sections of this. And, and really the importance of this is because you look at you know, the process that goes involved in, in design control. Uh, really, I have on the left, it's the ISO you know, kind of 7.3 standard, but then there's also the equivalent of the Part 80, Part 20 standard, which talks about planning. So that's why you see the kind of the, the slash in the middle. Uh, they just describe it slightly differently between the, the regulations. But it's important, you know, as you go through, you, you have your design development planning, where you're, de you're developing, you know, a product, you're, you're defining responsibilities, you're defining your plan on how you're going to get to that end goal. Um, you're, you're, de you're establishing your design inputs. You know, what is your, what is your medical product going to do? Um, what is its intended use? Uh, design outputs, looking at, you know, what is that evaluation going to look like to make sure that it's going to be doing what you need it to do by establishing things like acceptance criteria. Um, the design review process. The so design review process is critical to have during the stages of your product development so that you know that you are fulfilling, you know, as you go along. There's going to be iterations, there's going to be failures, and you're going to continue those reviews and ensure you're building off of that to make, you know, an effective product. Uh, design verification is ensuring that you met, you know, and manufactured a, 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 the product to meet those design requirements. And then the next one is uh, design validation. So it's a little bit different of a term than, than verification in that you want to make sure now you've made it properly, does it do what it's supposed to do? And that's more kind of when you're getting more on the clinical side where you're kind of saying, well, did this medical product do what it's supposed to do? And that's in your validation aspect of your design control process. Uh, design transfer, um, you know, you're taking all this information and you're now transferring it to, you know, how it's going to be manufactured, right? So a key deliverable of that process is uh, what we call production specifications. You know, how are they going to know, you know, what needs, you know, what needs to be made, how it needs to be made, what you need to control and what needs to be tested to ensure it was made properly on the manufacturing scale. And then, as I mentioned earlier, change control, design control, or design changes. You know, it's important that you, when you do make changes that they go through the process appropriately and validation verification takes place as changes are made, uh, whether before launch or after the product has been launched. And then all this uh, is built into what we call the design history file. Uh, it forms part of your package, regulatory package, which I'll talk about later on. Uh, but it's an important aspect of a medical device uh, development process. So uh, the, one of the terms I mentioned earlier was a risk-based approach. I'm going to talk to you a little bit, you know, uh, high level on, you know, what that means in terms of the regulations. So, you know, how the regulatory bodies, I mentioned Health Canada, US FDA, European, uh, you know, different notified bodies there, how, how they talk about risk in terms of the medical device itself is based off of a, a risk classification system as shown here. Canada has a class one to four, the uh, United States has one to three, and then Europe has their system of the 2A, 2B as well. Um, now you'll see the arrows on the right. And so basically as the risk goes up, so class one being low risk, you know, that, that's what this shows. And then based on that, and of course the requirements also go up as the risk of the uh, medical device goes up. And when I say risk, I mean, what is a medical device being used for? Um, you know, what's the indication? What's the treatment? What is it trying to diagnose? And that's how they kind of determine risk. The other thing is, are there other products on the market already doing it? Is yours a novel invention? Is there not a lot of clinical data out there on it? And that also plays into, you know, kind of this risk termination. So, you know, what, once you know kind of the category of your product, the risk classification of your product, you know, then you have to go into your regulatory filing to get the product approved. So this is a very important aspect of our industry is that in order for a medical device to be sold into a jurisdiction, it will need a regulatory approval. And this approval process is different, you know, in different jurisdictions. For example, in Canada, we have something called the Health Canada Medical Device License. Um, so these, so medical devices in Canada are approved through a medical device license application. Now these license applications are required for medical devices that are in risk categories two to four. Now the intensity of these applications, like in terms of what the information you have to provide to Health Canada does kind of go up as the risk goes up. So obviously a class four uh, risk would be a lot more information than a class two in terms of what the Health Canada would need to see in order to approve the product and issue the license. In the US, um, they have a process called the 510K or the PMA. The PMA is a pre-market uh, approval. And the reason you know, they have two is because one of them is, again, it's based on risk. It's based on what's already known out there. Um, so they have a term called predicate device. The predicate device is basically, you know, if somebody already out there has something doing something similar and they've already got approval for the FDA, then they've already gone through that vigor. So you can actually reference it and say, well, the predicate device did this, ours does this, and that helps the FDA in their approval process. Um, you know, PMA is more work because it is more novel. And, you know, there's a question that comes up, for example, you know, do you need to have clinical studies and what kind of clinical information do you need to provide 
in order to get regulatory approval. Um, but you know, when I go into a regulatory uh, submission, I do like to think of it as a process. Um, so you know, I look at what forms need to be completed, and you know what will need to be included in the package that's sent to the regulatory body. Uh, what technical information um, does the product need to meet? Um, so the FDA or Health Canada knows how the product is supposed to work and what its intended use is. Are there any technical uh, standards out there? So for example, you'll hear terms like ASTM, AMI, ISO, you know, et cetera, um, that already exist um, that may be applicable to the product you're working on. Or you could be defining it if it is novel you know, yourself and kind of looking at what's out there and kind of you know, developing um, that specification, you know, those acceptance criteria I mentioned earlier, part of your design control process. And then the last one is, you know, what testing data is necessary to present to the regulator? As I mentioned earlier, you know, is it, is it um, analytical testing? You know, is it, you know, um, what they call AQL testing, acceptable, acceptable quality level, or is it something like an actual clinical study that needs to be done based off the risk of the product? And this all kind of gets pulled together into the DHF, as I defined earlier, and plays a huge role in your regulatory filing. Uh, just to give an example, so I've talked a little bit about my progression. So I want to talk about one example of where you know I have done this and was successful with the FDA as an example. So this is an example of a uh, regulatory submission I did several years ago in 2016 for a surgical isolation gown uh, level three, I mean PP70 level three. You know, so the PP70 is the basically the standard that it was fulfilling. Level three was the level of uh, basically performance, um, which links to the safety. So the reason why that's important is you know healthcare practitioners. Um, you know, they use the product based off a of risk, right? So if they're in a high risk situation where they need an isolation gown, like a level three, level four, that's what they're looking for. They're not going to use an open back gown. They're going to use a full isolation gown like this. So level three gowns, you know, are high risk gowns and therefore the FDA required a 510K. Um, and so we went through the process of the 510K submission. A couple of key points from this is you look at a couple of terms you'll see on there uh, called a cl classification product code. So the FDA and Health Canada, they give these, um, you know, these, these three letter codes. If you can see it on that's FYC. Why is that important? Well, you know, what they try to do is they try to group these products in together so that it helps in the regulatory approval process. So they understand kind of where these products fall <coughs> and the associated requirements for those products. So on the slide, on the part on the right, you'll, you'll see something called recognized consensus standards, right? Those are in place so that, you know, you know, if the FDA has already identified what needs to be tested and what data you're going to need to show in order to get approval. So for example, ASTM F1670 or ASTM F2407. So in some cases, those are already available, which is great because it helps you guide you in that process of generating the data for regulatory approval. And in other cases, like a PMA, you know, a lot of that you're going to be determining your, yourself with your technical team and working with the regulator to ensure you have adequate data. Um, so another aspect, um, you know, once the product is on the market, and I mentioned the term internal audits earlier, but I want to go a little bit broader uh, with the concept of quality audits. I'm sure you've probably heard of the term audit before. Um, you know, in the medical device field, it does play a huge role as well. Um, there are what I call three major types of audits that, that do take place. Um, the first one is what I call an internal quality audit uh, to ensure internal processes are functioning as intended. Uh, and any of the, gener uh, the, the records that are generated. So as you, as you probably heard earlier, I mentioned the term forms. So forms are generated to show evidence of what you did. You know, it's a record, right? So you know, as your quality system happens and you're, you're running through these processes, you know, you're generating these forms as evidence. Now, what are they used for? They could be used for the submission, but they could be also used for you know, something I'm gonna get to later on, which is the third party audit, uh, which I'll talk about in a second. But it's very important to keep those records and maintain them as per the uh, document uh, retention policies. Um, internal audits should foster, and this is my own you know, kind of guidance on this, they should foster a, a culture of continuous improvement and not quality department policing the other areas of, of the organization. I truly believe this is true in the sense that we should be working together. As you know, you might have findings, but that's fine. Let's work together on, on determining you know, how to improve those, you know, how to make the organization better, whether within the QMS or the design of the product. Um, so it's very valuable tool um, audits and the uh, subsequent corrective action, preventive action, which I mentioned before, if it does come out of that process. Uh, the other concept is vendor vendor audits. So as I mentioned before, you know about the vendor management program. It's important that that companies identify the key vendors and implement the right level of control of those vendors, because of course, you know those vendors do play a role in the safety and effectiveness of the medical product that you're going to be manufacturing, right? So it's very important to have a well-established risk-based vendor management program. So vendor audits can and will be part of that, where you actually go to the, you know, different, depending on the type of uh, vendor, and actually audit their factory, as an example, or walk through their processes, whether it's how they manufacture the component that's going into your product, 
or you know their quality systems and how they're working make sure those are, are robust and working properly ensuring the right records because you never know you know in the event of for example a problem in the product in the field that you might have to go back and investigate why it happened and it may go back to one of your key vendors and then the last one is around third-party audits where you know you will you'll know, get audited as a medical device company you will get audited whether it's an iso audit you know getting your registration to iso 1345 or whether it's a regulatory body like the fda or health canada doing you know, an actual regulatory inspection. I've been through three FDA inspections myself and many, many health care inspections over my years in the industry. Um, you know, obviously it takes a lot of preparation, but a lot of that quality culture does help in the preparation to be ready for those inspections. And then clients. So depending on your business model, you may have clients that you're working with, a co-brand, a, a private label, a licensing deal. Um, you might be a contract manufacturer for them. It depends on what you're doing. And so they will come and audit you. Um, and they may have a robust audit program or they or maybe a small enterprise that's really just interested in seeing what you're doing, but you should be ready for either case uh, when you're in this industry. Um, the success of these audits is a reflection of the quality of the processes put in place, uh, of course, appropriate to what you're doing and the, and the product that you have, um, but it's also, you know, making sure that you have established the quality culture in your organization, uh, because, you know, it's very really important that it's not just quality doing quality, it's the whole organization has that quality culture. Um, the one thing I will mention, if you do have a failure doing, for example, a regulatory audit, that can lead to very negative consequences on the organization. Um, you know, a lot of times these um, outcomes of an audit is publicly available. So if you get a non-compliant rating from say Health Canada, that will be publicly available and people will be able to see that you got a non-compliant rating. So it's very important to ensure you achieve that compliant rating. Yeah, you might have a finding, you might need to address, that does happen like a 43, but you know, as long as it's not, you know, impacting safety and effectiveness of your product and you're able to address that with the regulator, you know, you're usually not gonna run into any issues. Uh, worst case scenarios, you know, you've heard of the, of the term, you know, recalls or a consent decree where you have to make an agreement with, you know, uh, the regulator to ensure you're going to do this and do this moving forward or else you have to stop making the product as an example. Um, so some key quotes from ISO 1345, and I thought these were you know, pretty important quotes. I just wanted to, to mention them. So the monitoring and measurement of processes and the process, again, is a nice uh, theme of this of this talk. The organization shall apply suitable methods for monitoring and as appropriate measurement of the quality management system processes. These methods shall determine or demonstrate the ability of the processes to achieve plan results. When plan results are not achieved, corrective and correction and corrective actions shall be taken as appropriate. So again, going back to the, the importance of processes. And then subsequent to that, the product itself. The organization shall monitor and measure the characteristics of the product to verify that product requirements have been met. This should be carried out at applicable stages of the product realization process in accordance with the plan and document arrangements and documented procedures. So again, you know, those key things I was talking about within the quality system, they connect directly to these two sections, the monitoring and measurement of processes and product. And obviously if you're, you know, fulfilling these, then you're doing your job, you know, within this reg highly regulated industry of medical devices and medical technology. So I just wanna leave a, with, a, with kind of a high level note here, you know, within the med tech space, there are a lot of roles to be filled. Um, hopefully today's presentation, which focuses on process, risk, and the regulations, uh, help provide some valuable information to you um, as you start your journey or continue your journey in the medical technology uh, sector. So I just, just want to thank you very much for your time today. My email is there if you, if you would like to contact me after this uh, session. Excellent. Thank you so much, Richard. So now we'll open it for a question and answer period. Uh, the audience, please feel free to write your questions in the chat, or you can open your microphone and just ask a question directly. Okay, until anyone writes something, uh, we did have some questions that came in during the registration for this seminar. Um, so let's start with the first one. Uh, so about the medtech market in Canada, is it primarily commercial R&D or is there R&D that happens at the national or academic level? So. Um, okay, well, good question. I mean, I think, you know, when I, when I, when I work with um, medical technology innovators, you know, it's looking at uh, a couple aspects, like, you know, what, what is the innovation? What is the uh, what are they trying to do with it? Is there a, is there a market need for it? Is there a large, you know, a large need for things? Um, I'll give an example of, for example, like an in vitro diagnostic. So, you know, one of the things we learned with the, with the pandemic was, you know, that we needed to be ready for something like this. Right. 
And so what I've seen you know, more recently is uh, a lot of these uh, researchers and innovators, whether university affiliated or small and medium enterprises, they are looking at potential you know, areas to target um, moving forward now that we've learned what we've learned during the pandemic. Um, so you know, there's federal kind of incentives for us to, you know, as a country in Canada, to you know, build these medical technologies to be ready um, for you know, the next pandemic, which you know, will happen, unfortunately, I have to say that. Um, and, and really kind of gear our, our innovations towards that readiness. And, and I've been in you know, different meetings about that topic specifically. Uh, beyond that, though, I mean, there's always kind of different innovations happening, uh, you know, within our great universities within the country and, and, and beyond. Um, and, you know, so, you know, I, I, I get exposed to different, you know, technologies, different products all the time. And they may not, you know, uh, they may not be a current, like, for example, pandemic or market need, but they, you know, offer some something to the market that maybe it hasn't, you know, the market hasn't seen or, um, you know, uh, betters or improves upon, you know, the existing um, technology uh, or device or whatever it is on the market. Right. So I, I see, you know, as, as innovation keeps happening and we keep fostering this, this culture of innovation within Canada and the universities, more and more products will be coming, uh, you know, in the pipeline. It does take a long time to get regulatory approval. I will mention that. So when you talk about commercial, you know, you, you, you look at the indication what you're going to be using the medical technology for or medical device or IVD for, as an example, you know, it, it's important to understand what that regulatory process uh, looks like and the time and what evidence you need to do, uh, you know, to get to that point of approval, right? But that's why companies like you know my company API and other you know, organizations out there help support that um, that journey. You know, as you go from that early concept all the way to a a product that's in the hands of through, for example, medical device license application. Excellent, thank you, uh, John. Please. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Richard. I very much appreciate you doing this presentation. You. Uh, You've described your career path, but my question is, how was how rough was that road? How how much of a struggle was it to get established in the field and find your way through it? Thanks. Yeah, good question. Um, so you know what's interesting is, and, and what I tried to kind of um, talk a little bit about in the presentation was, you know, starting on the engineering side, you know, you you, you know, and focusing on, as I mentioned, the the facility and equipment. You know, is it a natural progression to get into, for example, the quality management system? Is it a natural progression to get into regulatory submissions for medical products? You know, it, I, I've seen some people that follow the similar one, but but I do feel like you know mine was fairly unique in the sense that you know it took really um, a, a, an appreciation for the tools. So, for example, when I was working at companies like Aventus Pasteur and now Sanofi, you know, they had very well structured, you know, world class quality systems in place, right? So I learned a lot, you know, from the training sessions from the appreciation of that. And so you know, it really built up my, my uh, knowledge that I was able to um, utilize at a smaller organization like the Nucleus Pharmaceuticals that I joined when I moved out to Alberta. Um, and why was that important? And what, what, what happened in that transition? Well, you know, the regulations do have the expectation that the company is going to be following, you know, the, the, obviously the, the regulations related to quality systems and all those pertinent um, areas I talked about, right? So for me, it was a question of taking what I'd learned working with these big multinationals and applying that to a smaller scale, you know, to this to this smaller company, this this startup in in, in Alberta, and watching their system, you know, grow and evolve and mature until they, you know, obviously had a product on the market and were successful in that regard, right? And then, you know, as you go from um, company to company, like they have different products, even between drugs, natural health products, um, and medical devices, there is you know what I'll call transferable information, right? You know, the quality systems, there's a lot of overlap in those quality systems, um, you know, but yes, you have to adapt them. Yes, you have to modify them to the specific regulation or type of product that you are working with, right? So yes, that took some time, you know, to ensure that the system that we had at the different organizations uh, fulfilled, you know, what the expectations were within that. And there are some very specific clauses um, that talk about very specific requirements you need to have. Um, so for me, you know, it was, it was adapting and, um, you know, and learning and, and really, you um, I guess, making sure the quality system for the organization I worked at, and then of course the regulatory filing that was associated with that, you know, obviously lined up with the products that we were dealing with. And then the consulting world, I'll, I'll be honest with you, you know, I get, I get um, companies that are in all different spaces, you know, whether the medical devices, drugs, natural health products, and all different stages of their development life cycle, right? So what's interesting about those ones is, is that, you know, you're kind of put to say, you know, how can you guide us, you know, Richard and team, you know, whoever it is, I mean, any consulting really, um, and, and, and be able to say, you know, this is how I, I, I can guide you 
you know, in your journey because I've had this experience, you know, uh, at this company or, or through this channel or when I launched a product at this company, you know what I mean? So that's why I feel like, yes, there's definitely been hurdles. Like as you jump from drugs to medical devices to natural health products, but because of the difference, but you know, that would be an overall comment there. Great. Thanks. Excellent. So we have a live question from the crowd. Um, are there any international companies you audited that don't manufacture in Canada? And if yes, how are such audits different from audits of domestic companies? Uh, so very good question. Um, and I'm going to go one step further uh, to the term uh, language barrier. Uh, so in my career, yes, um, I have been, I was a, um, a certified quality auditor through ASQ and I have conducted audits uh, all over the world. Um, you know, whether, you know, domestically uh, in the US um, and then even in um, other countries like Indonesia, China, Malaysia, uh, you know, different countries uh, that are very important to the medical device industry in terms of manufacturing products or materials that are not as abundant here in Canada, as an example. Uh, but yes, yeah, so when I would go, uh, for example, audit China, um, when I say China, I don't mean the country, I just mean manufacturing sites within China. Um, what I would do is it, it was pretty intensive. So obviously it's a large, you know, uh, to go over across the ocean and go to China, I used to go on, for example, like three week trips. And in those three weeks, it was basically, you know, go to as many uh, factories as I could that were, you know, supporting us in manufacturing product or raw materials uh, in that three weeks. And then it would be like going to factory, to factory, to factory, to factory, you know, and try to get as many. And of course, you know, it's a large country as well. So I had to do a lot of travel, whether train, bus, whatever, right? But then the key thing comes into the play of, of um, you know, what language is their documentation written in? What language is their SOPs written in? What, what is their, uh, those records I was mentioning? What, what language are they written in? And a lot of times they're written in Chinese. Um, and unfortunately I do not read and write Chinese. Um, so it made it very difficult to conduct a quality audit um, to ensure they're fulfilling the requirements of, for example, ISO 1345 or 21 CFR 820. So, you know, the tool that we did use was we had, you know, um, people on our procurement team from the China office that would come with me as an interpreter. Um, so it was challenging, don't get me wrong. And, and sometimes, you know, you'd ask a question and have to be um, translated in a certain way to get the effect of that, um, if I can be honest in that comment. Uh, and then, you know, obviously, uh, you know, the, the organizations you're visiting will try their best to answer the question and ensure they can show you the supporting evidence. Uh, another interesting story I can tell you is that I actually hosted an FDA inspection of what of, uh, the manufacturing sites that my company had in China. So I was actually, you know, I went, I flew from Canada to China, the US uh, FDA individual went from the US to China and did an audit of the Chinese facility. And I was hosting the audit, but again, the documentation wasn't in English. So it was a very unique experience trying to host an audit when you can't read the documents that are being audited. Uh, but fortunately with translations and whatnot and the patience of the FDA and understanding that this does happen, um, we were able to you know, successfully go through that process. Um, you know, does the, does the uh, expectations or requirements change? I would say, no, they do not. Um, you know, the Canadian population or US population, wherever you're marketing the product, they expect the product to fulfill the regulations and there's no, really no shortcuts, right? So it's important that you work with your you know, uh, international suppliers and vendors uh, to ensure they're educated on what those requirements are and doing these type of audits to ensure they're fulfilling them. Perfect, thank you. All right, let's keep it rolling with questions from the audience. So our next one, do you have any tips for undergraduate students trying to enter the industry? Uh, yeah, so, I mean, I think, you know, there, there is, um, in my, in, in my uh, career, I've actually done a lot of, um, call it outside of, uh, outside of work learning. Um, there's a lot of tools out there now that may not have been available X number of years ago. Um, uh, YouTube is a good example. Um, you know, obviously the, the standards and regulations are already available out there. Like the uh, CFRs, the US CFRs are, are widely available. You know, some ISO standards are available for purchase, whatnot. Um, you know, I did a lot of side reading, <laughs> to be honest with you, to, to understand, um, you know, the regulations and, and, and the requirements in the type of products I was getting involved in. I think that was very important um, because it, it brings, you know, um, a, a lot of things when you, when you join into the industry that you already have kind of a baseline of, uh, you know, some of those requirements. Now, whether you're in an engineering program, you're in a science program, whether you're not in any of those programs. I mean, within a medical device or medical technology company, there are different people who play different roles, right? And, and you may have a marketing background as an example, right? But I, I do feel it's, it's, it's great to understand, you know, the, the, what your product is being used for, you know, the benefits it brings, 
um, you know, a little bit about, you know, the regulations. I mean, I'm not, you know, I've never asked all my, you know, staff and my companies to be experts in quality systems, but it, it's good to appreciate and understand why they're used, right? So even my talk today, hopefully gave you some background information on why those, those are important. Um, in my own kind of, um, you know, I'll call, I used to be uh, on the advisory committee at, at uh, North, uh, Northern Alberta Institute of Technology. I used to be on the biological sciences team there. And uh, it, it's a great school that looks at promoting, um, you know, uh, graduates getting right into industry, right? And so what I recommended there was really understanding the quality management system, the ISO requirements that, that regulate the industry. Uh, because if you have an, you know, an understanding and appreciation for those, it really helps you get into those environments. Because you know, if you're going from you know, never working in a regulated environment like that to working into a heavily regulated, regulated environment, sorry, um, you know, it, it can be uh, you know, a, a bit of a shocker, right? So I do encourage uh, that kind of learning. Um, but yeah, there's so many different technologies out there and so much exciting stuff. And you know, one of the proudest moments I could say in my career is when you launch a product, when you, when you all that work pays off and you launch a product, uh, it's such a rewarding feeling. Um, so you know, I definitely uh, you know look at my career and say, you know, I think I did the right things in doing what I did and getting into those technical and regulatory submissions. And you know, I do encourage um, you know young you know young minds, if I can call them that, um, you know, to look at that as a as a, a goal of their careers. Fantastic. And I would only add to that by saying that internship programs are a great way to break into the industry, mm -hmm. uh, like the MedTech Talent Accelerator, which is largely focused for graduate students, current graduate students, but is also open to undergraduates. And another way is to pursue a professional master's degree after your undergraduate. Um, and a shameless plug for McGill, we have a new <laughs> master's in translational biomedical engineering with core courses taught by industry experts and an industry internship capstone. So feel free to check out those programs as well. All right, next question here. How can you be sure that a device is worth pursuing before investing? Well, that is a very big question. Um, you know, obviously when you're looking at uh, what your, the intended use of the device is, uh, it's important to understand um, kind of the market need um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we talk about things like the pandemic, um, you know, looking at uh, things like in vitro diagnostics or medical technologies, you know, it, there is always the business case uh, that needs to be incorporated as you look at, um, you know, your medical product. I'll give you an example. Um, in Canada, um, there are certain groups um, that are in place that represent kind of what I'll call purchasing groups or buying groups. There's a, a company called HealthPro, organization called HealthPro, another one called MedBuy. Um, you know, their jobs are to basically source and bring in, you know, medical devices and other related products um, into, you know, the hospitals across the country, right? And why is that important? Well, they, they're talking to the hospitals, they're talking to the healthcare practitioners and saying, well, what do you need? What kind of volumes do you need? And then the other, of course, consideration is price points, right? Um, so, you know, the, the, they, they issue things called requests for proposals or requests request for quotes. And within those, you know, kind of processes, you know, it, it gives you a, a big uh, kind of indication of what the industry is looking for. Like when I say the industry, I mean uh, hospitals and beyond, right? Um, so th those are a tool that I've used in the past when looking at, you know, what products would be, um, would be valuable to go after. Another one is, of course, is an unmet need. Um, you know, uh, if it's something that's, there's no com comparable product on the market and there is a need for it, for example, you know, uh, there's a patient population that's affected by this condition or something like that, and this technology can help that. Um, you know, of course, you, you need to understand, you know, what will, uh, for example, the sell price be if it's a, you know, a large scale medical equipment, like, a, you know, a, something, you know, a scan, an MRI scan or something like that versus, you know, a, a more of a high commodity, uh, you know, high throughput product, right? Um, so there's a lot of considerations that need to happen. Now, what I try to do in my organizations is, uh, you know, bring the information from the product development, quality and regulatory side to understand the timelines and cost needed to get it to market. Right, um, because that is an important aspect. I mean, you're not going to be able to, you know, think of a medical device and sell it tomorrow. It's unfortunately, well, not unfortunately. There's a reason why it's not that case, right? Because you have to build the evidence um, and the information to provide to the regulator before they approve it to make sure it's safe and effective, right? And you want that as a, as a consumer, as a patient, as a hospital, you know, hospital worker, you want to make sure that these these uh, products have been tested accordingly, right? So there's a lot of different considerations. So yeah, how much will it cost? How long will it take to get to that point? which countries you want to go into, 
uh, what uh, intellectual property do you have under it? You know, uh, intellectual property plays a huge role in the industry in that if it's an innovative product, you want to protect that. You want to be the only player in that in that uh, category. Uh, if you know, for example, you put a lot of money into R and D and you want to be able to make that money back, right? So you spend a lot of money in your in your design development process and your uh, launch process. So you want to you know, have some level of assurance um, that you're going to make that money back, right? So the, I, so the strength of your IP is also an important consideration. So you know, these are all kind of factors that go into that. Um, hopefully that answers your question. Excellent. Thank you. Yes, definitely a loaded question with lots of factors <laughs> to consider. <laughs> all right, we have time for a few more questions here. So our next one, how early should a medical device startup engage in the regulatory process? Yeah, so th that question is as soon as possible. And I say as soon as possible because, you know, as I went through those, those quality systems that I was mentioning, uh, specifically the design control, you know, it's important to document that um, as you're going along, right? And that will lead and benefit you as you're doing your regulatory submission, right? Um, so I would say, you know, immediately, I, I, you know, a, a company in the, in the early stages of, of developing um, their product or technology, establishing a quality system is very important. Now. You're not going to be manufacturing it immediately, like when I say manufacturing, like large scale commercial manufacturing or anything like that. But you know those 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 specific kind of processes I was mentioning: document control, you know, training, uh, design control, uh, you know, the, the change control, the corrective predictive action, like all those those tools uh, I'll call them are very important, and they will be utilized um, as you go through your design process, your product development, uh, launch process, I'll call it, uh, because there's a lot of different stages, as I mentioned. Um, so yeah, I, I recommend getting involved as soon as possible. Yeah, your regulatory submission may be way down the road, uh, depending on the complexity of your product and the work that needs to be done. But you know, you're already documenting, you're already doing the right things right off the bat, which will make it an easier process when you get to that submission time frame. Okay, thank you. Uh, so here's a more general question. So what background do you need to find a career in this field? I mean, it's a good question. Um, you know, when we say, when we talk about the field, I guess it depends on what role you're going to play in the field. Um, I'll give an example, like, you know, if you're going to be kind of following a similar progression as mine, you know, a scientific or technical background is, is valuable. Um, but I've definitely seen, you know, quality leaders uh, at organizations that did not have a technical or scientific background. Um, you know, they had a BA, a BA or something like that, but, you know, they learned, they developed, they, you know, they understood and appreciated the regulations and became, you know, successful quality leaders. Uh, for me, I think, you know, the value of, for example, an engineering or a, you know, a, an applied science type of uh, background really helped me in understanding the technical processes, right? Uh, whether it's a manufacturing process or whether it's the design of a product, whether it's got a pneumatic system, electrical, hydraulic, you know, uh, these terms that you'll hear, you know, and it depends on the complexity of the device, right? Um, so, you know, it, again, it depends on what role you want to play, but I've definitely seen, you know, success of people from different backgrounds in terms of different educational um, backgrounds. But I do feel if you wanna you know, target product development, if you wanna target the technology side and the real technical side, you know, uh, I, obviously the science uh, and the engineering uh, you know, would, would lead right into that because of the transferable skills and, the, uh, and that, that kind of technical thinking. Excellent. And yeah, I would add to that, uh, you know, at least from the MedTech Talent Accelerator's perspective, uh, we have students participating from a wide range of areas in science and engineering, and uh, they're adapting in different ways within medtech because it's such a vast field. So uh, lots of opportunity out there. All right, questions are starting to run out. So Richard, maybe I would ask you any final words of wisdom, any lessons learned along the way that uh, <laughs> you can impart on our on our young and ambitious audience. Well, I think, you know, there are companies out there that are um, well-established companies. Like I was fortunate enough to join some very large players right off the bat. And it really kind of expedited my um, understanding and knowledge in the areas of, of GMPs, you know, whether medical device or pharma. And it was really great. And that was actually, my first ones were internships, um, you know, for example, with the University of Toronto. And, um, and it really, really helped, you know, kind of get me uh, positioned well to go to my interview for my first job that I got, for example, when I graduated. Um, so, you know, it was very, it was, it was very valuable having that, but at the same time, you know, some of these smaller players, some of these small innovators, whether university professors or, or, you know, small enterprises, I mean, some of the work they're doing is so exciting, right? I mean, you want to play an important role. And I see with smaller companies, you, you know, you get to be 
involved and potentially even wear more hats and be more you know integrated to all different aspects of the design development process. Whereas large organizations sometimes you know you have your you know specific role to play, right? So I think there's benefits in both. I think there's benefits um, you know working for small and working for large. I was lucky enough to work for large and then be able to utilize that knowledge for small and grow them as a company. I think that was very rewarding. Um, so when you look at the companies out there, you know, and you want to work for them, you know, you could look at either. You could look at the large ones, or you can look at the small ones. I mean, they, they, you're going to play an important role either way. Um, but that's you know something you can consider as you're as you're uh, as you're developing into your career. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. So with that, Richard, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and your insight. I'm sure it was a benefit to everyone. So audience, please join me in a virtual round of applause for Richard Roy. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> I see the virtual hands coming up. <laughs> okay. Perfect. And thank you to everyone in the audience for attending. We'll see you at the next Explore MedTech Innovation.